Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about Halloween and more specifically, I want to address this idea that Halloween is evil and pagan and wicked and Christian should have nothing to do with this special day. So yeah, let's get started. Now, I don't know what Halloween was like for you, but for me growing up, I actually quite enjoyed Halloween. I think most of the years I dressed up as a ninja, as a samurai, or some kind of like Asian martial artist, because that was like what I was into all the time. I remember running down the street with my little brother and my sister, and we would compete on who could get the most candy and who could get the best candy. And for me, Halloween really was just that simple and that innocent. It was just about hanging out, having a good time. And if there was one thing that was truly evil about Halloween, it was the jack-o'-lantern. I hated, hated, hated having to cut open that thing and stick my hand inside and get all the slimy seeds out. And like, yeah, that, that for sure, that's evil and that's wicked. But as I got older, my view on these things would change because I became a Christian, I gave my heart fully to the Lord, and I was now surrounded by a church community, by friends and family, people who would pretty much every single time that the fall would come around, they would share one important message that I needed to learn for myself. Halloween is bad. Halloween is evil. Halloween is the devil's playground and Christians really should do nothing with it. They should just stay at home, turn the lights off and don't even hand out candy because then you're going to be supporting all these little kids and deceiving them and all kinds of horrible and negative things. What? Now I remember even at that time thinking, man, this seems really strong for a day that's just all about getting wasted on sugar. Like, is it really that bad? I mean, sure, I know kids, they can get cavities and all, but this seems like a little extra. But the thing was that I really trusted these people. I really just loved the kinds of friends that were pouring into my life. And so I just took this advice at face value. I didn't really apply any critical thinking, any actual logic or any research of my own to making my own thoughts about this subject. Now, fast forward a couple of years later and I finally make it through Bible college. It's actually my first year out of Bible school and I have my first job in Southern California. It didn't actually pay very well. And so I had a lot of free time and I had very little money. And so I took up reading and I would read book after book after book, books on religion and more specifically books on philosophy. And as I was studying philosophy, I came across this concept of fallacies. I learned that there were really rules and guidelines of logic and debate and that there were right ways to, to come to the conclusion of something and wrong ways. And that these fallacies were examples of terrible logic. One fallacy in particular stood out to me, and this was the idea of the genetic fallacy. The genetic fallacy, AKA the fallacy of origins, for those of you guys who don't know, is a fallacy of irrelevance that's based solely on something or someone's origin, their context, or their history, rather than its actual present day and current in, uh, interpretation or context. In other words, it is bad logic to simply accept or reject something simply because of where it came from. Where it came from has nothing to do with whether or not something is good or bad, if it's true or it's false. And this makes sense because rituals and, and symbols and histories and, and the current interpretation of things simply changes all the time. One of the common examples that is given in the example of a genetic fallacy is this idea of wedding rings. People would say back in the days that wedding rings were evil and that you should never use it because wedding rings were a symbol of slavery. That it was an example of how husbands used to put chains around their wives' ankles to forbid them from running away and that wedding rings remember that time frame. And by wearing a wedding ring, you're supporting slavery. Now, of course, none of you guys would ever accept that kind of logic because today wedding rings have nothing to do with slavery. It's a symbol of commitment and love and trust and this lifelong journey that you're going to be engaging with with your spouse. Aww. Symbols and rituals change all the time. What matters isn't how it started, but what matters is how you interpret it today. Even in the church, there are so many things that we have that are, that are pagan in origin, but we accept all the time. For example, if you drive down the highway and you see that bumper sticker, you see that symbol of a fish and you immediately think, oh yeah, that's Jesus, that's Christianity. But the reality is, is this has nothing to do with Christianity. That old symbol of the fish actually was used by many other pagan religions before Christianity ever touched it. Ask any neo-pagan today and that symbol of a fish was actually the symbol of a woman's womb. It was made by two overarching crescents to kind of symbolize this woman's fertility cycle and many religions use 
use this, whether they were Babylonian uh, religions, uh, Buddhist religions, even Egyptian religions. Many people use the fish before Christians use it and redefined what it meant. Another example of the church adopting paganism is this very idea of the church steeple. The fact that your church has a steeple on top of it is actually a throwback to back in the days when pagan religions would erect obelisks and other kinds of monuments in, in, in homage and honor of their pagan gods. And yet when you see a church out there with a steeple on it, no one says, oh, that's a pagan church. And perhaps the last and most convincing of all of it is in fact the cross itself. Today, you and I understand that the cross is a symbol of the sacrifice of Jesus. That is the ultimate expression of God's love. But the cross was not always this. The cross was originally a symbol for crime and punishment for rebellion and shame. It had absolutely nothing to do with God's love and his sacrifice. This was actually one of the reasons why so many people had trouble accepting who Jesus was. How could Jesus be God if God would be associated with the cross? But what's amazing about this is that Christianity took that symbol of derision, that symbol of shame, and re-adopted it, reinterpreted it for us today. And that's why today you and I have no problem wearing a shirt or wearing a bracelet that has a cross on it because the cross doesn't mean what it originally meant, but the cross means something new and fresh to us today. And so the question that we should ask ourselves when it comes to Halloween or any other kind of ritual or holiday is not what did it used to mean, but what does it mean today? What does Halloween mean to you today? If Halloween for you is primarily a day of drinking and drugs, of partying and sleeping around and doing all kinds of mischief, then yeah, of course, Christians should have no part in this, whether it's on Halloween or any other day of the year. But, and this is a big but, if this is not what Halloween means to you and Halloween is primarily a day to hang out with friends and family, it's a day, yes, you might have a little too much uh, sugar or something like that, but it's a day of playing board games and hanging out and having a good time, and yes, maybe even dressing up, the question is, is, is there anything wrong with doing that? Because if I think about it for myself, no, I don't think that that's wrong. So listen, at the end of the day, what matters most is what God is saying to you. What matters most is what the Spirit is convicting you of. And so wherever you end up landing on this conversation, wherever you end up deciding about Halloween, I wanna challenge you to do one thing. I wanna challenge you to not just be a mindless sheep following what everyone else does, but instead to stop to apply a little bit of critical thinking and to pay attention to what God is telling you through his spirit. Because at the end of the day, if you're doing that, there's no way you can be led astray. Go this Halloween and experience faith in the first person.